what's up, Internets? It's Tobin. This is Fuzzy Talent Streamcast number 17, which has no title whatsoever. It's probably going to be called uh, Potpourri or Random Crap or something like that. We're basically going to look at three projects I've done in the last uh, 30, 60 days that were fairly quick uh, and easy projects, but did some things that might be interesting that you might find useful for some projects you're doing. I should apologize ahead of time. I was in like a four hour meeting today, which went well in the sense that everybody liked the stuff that I was doing, but it went poorly in the sense that A, it was a meeting, and B, uh, it went so well and they liked it so much I've been invited to go to two additional meetings. So I feel like I've had the equivalent of a intellectual uh, high colonic and a little mushy. But we'll get through this. Uh, you will be entertained. So, first project I want you to take a look at. Unrecorded Maps Viewer. Did he just use that font? Oh my goodness, yes he did. What was he thinking? Anyway, I had somebody just wander in my office and go, look, we've got an intern. Whenever somebody says they have an intern as their introduction, you're, you might be in trouble. Well, we've got an intern, and they've scanned like almost 4,000 unrecorded maps. I don't know why they're unrecorded. I don't know why they're maps. I don't know why they're scanning them. And we want to put them out on the web with a viewer so people can view the maps. And I said, okay, this sounds like the most boring thing I've ever heard of. How fast can I do this? And it took two, three hours. Basically, what I did was, first I used Image Magic which Image Magic has been bringing the awesome forever. I was using Image Magic back on Sun Solaris in the day. I mean, I wasn't. People like James Fee were. I am much too young for that. I'm 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 young and I'm I'm young and I'm very pretty. But Image Magic been around forever. Great tool. So I did a Morgify Mogrify to just batch resample them because they'd resample they'd scan them at like the highest possible quality for JPEGs and they were just enormous. And I could I could re Resample them at 30% quality, and you couldn't tell a difference. That's what I did to make them manageable sizes. And then I bought, and I guess this is the only interesting part of this project, is I bought something because, I, you know, I don't like to buy things. I bought this uh, from Code Canyon, this jQuery image viewer, pan zoom image viewer, because it's 8 bucks. I mean, it ends up being 10 bucks when you buy it, but it's 10 bucks. 10 bucks, man. And... All the other options I looked at that were free and open source would require some fiddling. And to me, 10 bucks not to have to fiddle with something like this, I'll spend 10 bucks. So, and that's why this project isn't out on GitHub because really the only thing it does is this thing that's like 10 bucks and is not open source. So, basically, you pick an image, you get a nice little loading animation, it loads up, you can pan and zoom it, see all the stuff, why anybody wants to know about. Uh, a physical survey of, of this one thing. I, I just don't know. But it's out there. It's basically the search box is doing a, a text filter on the web page, on the element itself in jQuery, which uh, I'm going to have to replace at some point because as you see there, it's a second or two to process and they're only halfway done with the images. There's close to 4,000 of them. I mean, I have to do a little server side, you know, searching at some point. But that's basically what that does when it loads an image. You get this download image for printing, which basically means, hey, here's a direct link to the image. And that's it. That's what that does. And it was probably not 100 lines of code in this whole thing. Let me see. Uh, is, is that it? Yeah, that's it. Look at that. It's like 91 lines of code. And that's including uh, three random blank lines here that are there for no reason whatsoever. So, very simple thing. Just throw some images out there. Do that. Ten bucks. Piece of cake. Next project. The Map Widget Maker. Now, Brian Timoney had that great post uh, pretty recently on the way people actually use maps. And it got me to thinking. And we've got this open data portal that... Uh, one day I'm going to get back around to and spruce up a bit. One of the things I wanted to do was make 
basically on YouTube you can get a get the video and get the iframe code and embed it right on your site. I thought you should be able to make a map from a WMS service and, and a base layer and get an iframe widget the same way you would a YouTube widget and put it right on your site. So I wanted to make that. So that's what I did and it's out on GitHub and I'll post links to all this stuff in the show notes. You basically pick a layer from your WMS service. Your WMS layers I'm sure will have much better titles and descriptions than ours does because we suck. Anyway, when I say we, I'm generally talking about me. Uh, base map, you can pick your base map. You can pan and zoom it to where you want whether you identify on click or not, what size you want your iframe, and then you just copy your code, put it on your site, off you go. It's a little beta and a little buggy. I've already seen a, a bug or two just looking at it for this podcast. But it works. It's kind of neat. A couple of things I thought might be interesting with this is, first, you have to decide how you want to do something like this. There's basically two routes. You can do a JavaScript widget or an iframe. A JavaScript widget has the advantage of much better direct integration with your page. It inherits your page's CSS, so the styling will be the same, and it's very easy for JavaScript to communicate with the JavaScript on the page, because it's all just sitting there on the page. The downer of it is it's really a tricky thing to do uh, for security reasons. You're, it's very easy to have JavaScript collisions in terms of variable names or function names. Um, the person that embeds this has to really trust you because you could write JavaScript in there that would break their whole page or read any kind of private data on their page or just basically do anything, capture information about the users. Uh, JavaScript widget to me is a much more appropriate thing for like an internal sort of thing. Like, your internal GIS group is making this for your, uh, oh, God, help you SharePoint site. So, an iframe uh, is sandboxed. So it's much secure. It's much safer to put on a page. So it's much more likely for people to embed on their own web pages. Uh, It does not inherit the page's CSS, which is probably fine for something like this because you're really looking at a map. There's not a whole lot of text there to inherit. And it does, uh, you can communicate via JavaScript from the iframe to the parent, but it's a little bit tricky. We'll take a look at that. First, let's look at one other thing. This load capabilities um, on the widget maker basically it's doing get capabilities to a web service. Let me back up one step. There's a configuration file that's just a small JSON file for the widget maker. Basically, you give it what base maps you want to use, the WMS URL to the WMS server you want to use for the overlays, any kind of filtering you want to do in attribution, and the default pan and zoom. It's pretty straightforward. Now, jQuery will um, process XML. So what we're doing is we're loading our get capabilities response and for, for each layer, we're basically saying if it meets any filters we passed, then get the name, title, and abstract. And then we will throw that right in our, our page. And that's all you need. The name is what you need to get back to the layer later. That's what you're passing to the, to the iframe itself. Title and abstract are the proper, t- the pretty title and basically an abstract of what it is. So you can process XML in jQuery. It's it's nobody's favorite. I, I don't think processing XML is anybody's favorite thing to do anywhere, but it's really not bad at all here. Now for communicating between an iframe and a parent, from the iframe side, it's very straightforward. You just uh, basically, you make a message, and here we're making an array of the lat long and the zoom level, and we're passing that message back to the parent by window parent post message. This star basically means pass it back to any parent 
uh, a parent from any domain. You can filter it there, so you're only passing this information back to a, a specific domain, if that is what the parent domain is. On the parent side, it's a little bit wordier. Basically, all of this right here is a way to get around differences in browsers and how they handle this. But when it gets this message back, we're basically saying split that array up. Um, and from there, you're basically uh, setting some variable. You're rewriting that config file, the, the uh, centroid and the zoom level in memory, not, not the actual file, but just w what's loaded in JavaScript memory on the browser. And you're recreating that iframe URL. So you see this URL has, uh, look at these coordinates, like negative 80.8475. We go back here and we pan and zoom around. Now you see we're on negative 80.8309. So that's basically that communication. It's the only neat thing about this app, which is only neat in an alpha geek sort of way, is it's using the the map widget maker to make the map widget maker. Like this actual bit right here, the map, is the iframe that you will see when you're done. This is an iframe. So you see if I change the base map here, it reloads this whole whole iframe because it's, it's changing the source URL. So it's kind of recursive, which is uh, cool in a Stallman kind of uber way. Anyway, that's it about the embed maps, things I thought were cool. Next, quality of life dashboard. This is not a tiny project. I mean, it's not huge. It's not huge in terms of hours at all. Um, but it's been going on so long that, you know, it, it feels bigger. But there are a couple of interesting things here. One, this is all, and so is the widget map waiver. It, it uses uh, Twitter Bootstrap. I've recently gotten into Twitter Bootstrap, and I love it. It is just great. You can do JavaScript widgets with no JavaScript. I mean, it's including this bootstrap JavaScript file, and if it finds things with these classes, it'll automatically do things to it, like a, a modal box, a modal dialog like, like this. I didn't have to write any JavaScript for that. That's just the way I, I tagged the HTML code at Node to do it. It, it, it knew to do this. So it's really, really neat stuff. Now, one of the site that I ran across is called Initializer. I hadn't seen it before. What it does, it combines the awesomeness of HTML5 boilerplate and Bootstrap. So HTML5 boilerplate is really like a great boilerplate HTML5 best practice kind of thing for coding and for, it has like an HD access file for it. The, the you know best in class settings for your for Apache. Uh, it's not really a web development framework like Bootstrap is. So this combines HTML5 boilerplate. You can tell it exactly what you want and download it. And it is my new default starting template. It it is great. Like I say in Starship Troopers, uh, this is this is my new sergeant until it. Uh, uh, it either gets killed or I find someone better. So, initializer is a great template starting point. A couple of neat things I did here, at least I thought were neat. Uh, first, this sidebar kind of combines a collapsible or an accordion with regular elements. This whole thing is basically an unordered list, so these are all LIs in that list items in that unordered list with these ones with the arrows having a drop down. And I couldn't really get a good way for Bootstrap to do that. Bootstrap does have a collapsible, but it's spaced out differently and you can see it's kind of a, it's a very wordy sort of thing. Very verbose. So what I did, which I thought was kind of neat, is I made in this unordered list, that's that sidebar, I'd have some with a class of this metrics dropdown. And that's the one I wanted to use my, my dropdown for. And then I just gave it a P or paragraph class 
and told pretty much all of them but the first the default one to hide so hide all the rest of them then in JavaScript what I did was and it's this right here it's like five seven lines of code basically say if that side nav list item metrics drop down class gets clicked um, uh, make it uh, remove active from the add add an active class to it which basically colors it that blue remove active class from all of its siblings and then uh, for the children p tags which are the p tags in that the li list to animate those basically animate the height for 250 milliseconds so when you click on those oop, Roman, oop, Roman. when you click on those it animates them up and down for 250 milliseconds. So that's a collapsible accordion and like five lines of code with just some jQuery. Really, really simple thing. You might find that useful. The other thing I want to talk about for this was one of the changes that I did is I tossed out fusion tables for, for the map, fusion tables in Google Maps, uh, really because I wanted it to be a vector layer for interaction, like you can see here as we're, we're moving, uh, we're looking at actual data. You can see the, the polygon being highlighted. And Fusion Tables API has a limit to the number of uh, basically classification buckets you can use through the API. And that, that was just pissing me off. So completely threw out the map thing. I did all this over the course of a weekend because that's a problem with having a site done like a year ahead of time is you won't look at it for three months then you'll look at it and you go oh my god what was I thinking and you just want to dump it out and do it again so I did that over the course of the last weekend because uh, I knew this meeting today was coming up for four hours wow um, so what I want to tell you about JSON GeoJSON is some ways to make it smaller GeoJSON can get kind of big it's one of those things where the size really isn't the size because the text file as it's going out of your web server, it should be getting gzipped. So I think the total size on this was like 370 kilobytes by the time I was done messing with it. But over the network, it's like 60 or 70. So over the network, it's very small. Nice thing about JSON. How to make it smaller. There's a number of ways you could do this. I'll go into QGIS because it's, it's the awesome. I'll load up a layer like this. And I'll, you can, first thing you want to do is simplify the layer and simplify the crap out of it. I, you go to geometry tool, vector geometry tools, uh, simplify geometries, and I gave it like a hundred feet. Now that will lead to little artifacts when you're zoomed in close, like you'll see, see these little slivers and overlaps. Uh, uh, yeah, for this application, no one cares about that. Sorry, engineers. No one cares about that. What they want it to do is be fast. As long as the polygons are still recognizable, as polygons are good. So do that to simplify it. And that took it down from like a three megabyte file to a maybe a 700 megabyte file. Um, maybe 600 megabyte. <laughs> megabyte. 600 kilobyte file maybe 6 or 7 kilobyte file from 3 megabyte file so next thing one of the other things that will take up a lot of space in your GeoJSON file is uh, the number of coordinates that are being the precision of the coordinates you look in that GeoJSON file and you'll see that uh, oh and I should have mentioned from QGIS, you want to take your shape file or, or post just layer, whatever, and save it as GeoJSON. You just right click, save as. GeoJSON is your know, list of many, many output formats. Just make sure you change the CRS to WGS84. So your coordinates are being stored in lat long. Uh, you'll see when you, you look at the coordinates after you make that, is it may store 10, 12, 15. Uh, places after the decimal. You don't need all that. And for polygons, that's taking up a lot of space in that text file. So what I ended up doing is writing just a little bit of JavaScript, and I'll put this in the show notes. And you can actually run this with the page you're looking at up 
right from Google Chrome's tools, from their their basically their console. So if I I don't think I have this data set, but you could go um, from the console, basically copy this stuff in, and if your GeoJSON you're loading was sent to this temp data variable, it would work. Basically, it says temp data for the GeoJSON for each of the features. Get the coordinates array, and for each coordinate in that coordinates array, you're doing this math.round dance where you're basically saying, give me five, round it to five points after the decimal point. And then you're taking this JSON stringify, just basically flops out your, your GeoJSON to the console. And that took it from like, you know, like 600 kilobytes to around 370 and going over the network again that's like 60 or 70 kilobytes so handy little bit of JavaScript it's good to simplify but you also want to make sure you're not storing coordinate pre precision that you just don't need to because a, in a polygon layer like that unless you're just looking at squares most of your storage space is going to be those coordinates so that is some projects I've had least recently, some of the kind of neat things about them, and I hope you find that helpful. Anyway, it's Tobin. I don't know, I have no idea what I'm going to talk about next month. Um, I thought I was done talking about Tile Mill and, and gushing over how awesome it is, and then they released version 10, and it's even more awesome. But I have no idea what I'm going to talk about. I'm sure it will be something. Anyway, have a good weekend. Bye-bye.